morning gentlemen today we will talk about how the resistance of a ship gets affected if it moves in shallow water as compared to its movement in deep water practical experience of course has shown us that when a vessel goes from deep water to shallow water typically from a sea to a river speed drops tremendously. We will see if it is possible for us to determine a speed power relationship or speed resistance relationship in shallow water taking the values of deep water as known. What happens in shallow water? Uh, imagine a vessel moving in a limited water depth as the vessel moves forward, the water flows past the ship as we have seen and because of restricted availability of water depth, the water will speed up at the bottom, the velocity will increase. If the velocity increases, what will happen to pressure? Pressure will drop. We have seen previously that as uh, in the midship region that is middle of the ship the pressure is low anyway. So, this pressure falls further <coughs> and as it falls further the immediate effect is with the same immersion of the ship the upward force reduces. Therefore, the vessel will experience a sinkage because ultimately for the vessel to remain afloat buoyancy has to equate weight, right. So, if the pressure drops in a large portion of ship's length, buoyancy reduces at the same water level. Therefore, the vessel must experience a sinkage, so that the buoyancy and weight equalize and the vessel is in equilibrium. So, that is one effect that takes place, but that does not reduce the speed velocity which has increased, that stays. This sinkage is not uniform, it is not that the ship parallelly sinks, there is a large drop of pressure in the forward side of the ship and a little smaller drop of pressure in the aft side of the ship. So, the vessel actually sinks more in the forward end and less in the aft end. So, apart from sinkage there is a trim by bow and as you will know trim by bow is not a very uh, desirable phenomenon. This goes on, if you go to shallower and shallower water, this vessel will go on like this till it touches the bottom. This has of course, effect on resistance and uh, the effects will be the change in pressure will give a change in pressure forces, which is the pressure resistance and this would also change the frictional resistance because you have got increased velocity past the ship. Am I clear? This is one effect which we can understand. The other effect that is much more severe perhaps is due to a change in wave pattern. The wave pattern in deep water and the wave pattern in shallow water are quite different. So, the wave that the ship generates would now change in its pattern and uh, okay, the general uh, relationship of speed to wavelength we have seen as uh, I mean, is not it what we had given last time that speed of the wave is equal to this in deep water, this is what we had seen yesterday uh, when we discussed about wave making. But in shallow water actually I would not say in shallow water the general form of this equation is slightly <coughs> different. Let me write the general form of this equation.
this is general form that is v square is equal to that is the speed of a wave of length x length l w in water is equal to is given by v square equal to g l w by 2 pi multiplied with tan hyperbolic 2 pi h by l w where h is the depth of water. Okay, now, this is look at this uh, this term tan hyperbolic what is the property of this term if h is large tan hyperbolic 2 pi h by l w which becomes large now 2 pi h by l w this tends to 1. So, if this tends to 1 then this becomes equal to this which is the deep water expression we have seen earlier. Now, if it is low if h reduces if h is small that is this whole quantity reduces then tan tan hyperbolic 2 pi h by l w changes to tends to be just 2 pi h by l w that is tan hyperbolic of a small quantity is equal to the small quantity itself you know this is not it if theta is small tan theta is equal to theta. So, at small angles tan hyperbolic 2 pi by 2 pi h by l w will tend to be 2 pi h by l w. So, then what is v square let us see Can you see that? So, in shallow water, the speed of wave has a limiting value g h, or this is called the critical speed v critical is equal to root over of g h in shallow water. This does not occur, this is not a critical speed if h is not low, but when h reduces, there is a critical speed root over g h. Can we see the wave pattern? Let us see how the wave pattern changes. The we have seen in deep water if there is a pressure point here, then we had seen a set of waves are generated enclosing them. If there is a pressure point, then we have a set of divergent waves like that, and a set of transverse waves, they intersecting the divergent waves on the line itself, like that here. Here, these are the cusps where wave suddenly rises up. So, this is this angle we have seen was 19 degrees 28 minutes. Now, this will happen in deep water. Now, the vessel goes into shallow water and as h reduces this angle increases. Now, just imagine that this angle increasing that means, the divergent waves will come nearer to each other is not it just take this line out. So, if I draw an extreme case, how will the waves be? Like that. like that as if they will emanate from one point and they will tend towards each other right and what is this is this was the angle here this was the angle angle of envelope 
right. Now, you see in the limiting case, this will become 90 degrees that is when v equal to v c critical speed is reached at that height that uh, water depth h, then angle will become equal to 90 degrees. What does that mean? It means that there will be one divergent wave starting at the pressure point itself and traveling along with it and the height of it will be very high. It is as if all waves are merged into a single wave traveling along with the pressure point. Okay. Now, we increase the speed further beyond uh, uh, critical speed. What will happen? The, this angle will fall. Obviously, we have seen that one condition is that waves do not travel forward. So, it cannot go forward in any case. So, this angle will reduce again, but the nature of the divergent waves will change. That is, the divergent waves in instead of concave and going out, they will become convex like that. Okay. And there will be no transverse wave. Transverse wave have vanished here. As the angle became 90 degrees, the transverse waves vanished. They will not appear again because there are no concave divergent waves. This is V greater than V C. So, since wave pattern changes completely, the resistance will change. Is that clear? Am I clear? Okay. Now, how do we take into account in resistance? Will this problem was studied way back in 1908 by Sir Thomas Havelock, whose name I have mentioned while talking about wave making. He is a pioneer in wave resistance of ships. He postulated whether it is true or not is debatable, but mostly true because it more or less agrees with experiments that the wave making resistance of a ship will be same for the same wave speed. The wave making resistance of a ship will be same for the same wave speed. If the wave speed was same, then the wave making resistance will be same. What have we seen? We have seen that as the depth increases, uh, reduces, the speed of wave reduces. Is not it the expressions that I gave earlier? Compare this with this. L w is large, so this will be higher than this. So, as h reduces, the wavelength reduces. So, if the wavelength reduces or other wave speed reduces and therefore, the wave resistance will be same for the corresponding speeds between deep water and shallow water. Uh, if I draw it, I think it will be easier if I draw it in the form of a diagram, but first let me tell you uh, how we can determine this drop in speed for the same wave making resistance. Let us call it intermediate speed that is a speed at which wave making resistance will be same as that in deep water. Am I making myself clear or not? If I am not making myself clear, please ask me. What I am saying is that if the ship had a wave making resistance R w at a speed v in deep water, then it will have the same wave making resistance 
R w at a lower speed V i in shallow water of depth h. Is that clear? Have you understood? Should I do a diagram? I will repeat this diagram a number of times. This is the resistance. this is resistance, this is speed, this is R t in deep water. Okay. What is R f? This is R f. So, this is R r, most of which is we are making resistance, we will take this as we are making resistance of a ship. Let us take a speed V, this is the way making resistance, this much, is not it? This will be same at a lower speed V i. How to determine V i, we will see. in shallow water due to wave making effects alone. That is why it is called intermediate speed, we will see other effects. This will come here, this point. Is that clear? That is, this is R w and so is this. Okay. Have I made myself clear? So, you see what is happening is the wave resistance is same, but at V i the frictional resistance has reduced. That is why I am saying that this only due to wave making. We have not considered the friction effects or pressure effect which we discussed that the pressure will reduce at the bottom because of increase in speed that we have not considered. We have considered only resistance due to wave making. We have said that this will change to this place. Now, how do we calculate this? V i square is equal to G L w by 2 pi into tan hyperbolic 2 pi h pi L w and V infinity square is equal to G L w by 2 pi. Right? We are saying that this resistance of wave making due to this V i is same as resistance of the ship in deep water at speed V infinity, infinite means infinite depth. Then we can say V i by V infinity is equal to tan hyperbolic 2 pi h by L w which we can also write as tan hyperbolic g h by v infinity square. This also square. Okay. Oh, half. And V infinity minus V i is the drop in speed which we call delta c. So, you can actually calculate V i by V infinity and redraw this get this point. Okay. Now, this is the wave effect, the other effect that is uh, due to uh, increase in speed of water because of rest constriction, which will have a numerous effects actually. It will change the pressure forces, so axial pressure component will change, change in the resistance, pressure resistance. It will also increase frictional resistance and lot of effects will come because of increase in speed. There will be another drop in speed, which we can say as uh, 
delta V p. That is the total resistance that we have experienced will now occur at a drop in speed of delta V p. You will understand what I am saying in a little while. Slisting, you have heard the name of slisting. Again, a very famous name in study of viscous flow. Slisting said that speed loss delta V p can be represented as midship area square root a midship is midship area of ship and h is depth of water. So, midship area of ship square root divided by depth of water this quantity will determine how much of sorry it is not equal to this will determine how much of speed drop will be there. The dependence of delta V p will be on this quantity he made a number of experiments and came to this conclusion that a midship square root divided by h should determine what is the drop in speed and he produced a diagram that is if I plot this V h by V i V h being the final speed where V h is the final speed V i we have seen is the intermediate speed. So, the drop of speed the ratio of the two speeds would start from 1 at uh, this 0 h is large and till about uh, till about 0.4 this would be something like this curve will come something like this this is your slisting curve slisting what is the spelling of slisting slisting gave this curve that is a midship square root by h in this uh, representation there is one problem. Problem is what when a vessel goes in a channel the restriction is not only in the bottom but also in the sides. Exactly same effect will occur also in the sides that is there will be increase in speed and de increase in uh, decrease in pressure and it will have effects in both wave making as well as frictional not wave pressure resistance other pressure resistance and uh, frictional resistance. So, Land Weber modified this to what he called is hydraulic radius, maybe you have heard of this. Instead of this quantity, this h, he defined a hydraulic radius r h, r h is equal to C s cross sectional area of channel divided by what uh, weighted uh, perimeter of channel now this you will see if i take a rectangular channel then cross sectional layer channel is b into h divided by weighted perimeter is b plus 2h is that correct okay now, assume B to be very large. If it is very large, this tends to be B and B, B cancel and you get H. So, if the channel is not restricted breadth wise, then this is same as this parameter H which uh, Slisting had taken. But if B is less, then the parameter modifies itself to R H. 
that is weighted radius uh, sorry hydraulic radius. If now there is a ship in the channel, then this will modify itself R h in case of ship in channel. What will it become? B h minus a midship that is that is the reduced area. The area of the channel is now B h minus the area of the ship is not it? These are channels, these are water line, now, this is my ship, this is a midship. So, this area is actually this and what is the uh, weighted perimeter? B plus 2 h minus s, where s can be the girth of ship that is this. Okay. So, this is the weighted perimeter. With this parameter, Landover analyzed a number of uh, uh, experimental data and he found a slightly different curve. This is Landweber, that is based on R h and this was based on h. Okay. So, once this curve is obtained, we can find out what is the ratio between V h and V i. This curve is experimentally determined and found to be matching with some uh, full scale resistance data. I am saying some because I will come back to this later. So, on this curve, if I draw the V i by V infinity now, see I, I can draw the V i by V infinity with a base of this also can be drawn to a base of uh, V infinity by root g h. I, I, we have seen this no? V i by V infinity as a function of V infinity by root g h. So, you can do this and that curve would look something like this. This is V h by V i curve uh, sorry V i by V infinity curve. This is all given in textbooks. You can see these diagrams yourself. How does the resistance curve change now? We can draw a resistance curve for a ship now. This is R t, this is speed. The same curve that we drew before, what is that? We drew this curve, is not it? Let us say this is R t in deep water. And this gives me a CF that I call it RF in deep water. Okay. At a speed V, let us say here, this is V infinity, this is my wave making resistance. I calculate my VI, I can calculate VI. So, this is V i, at this V i my wave making resistance will be same, this point will come somewhere here. That is this point moves to this point, the resistance here at V i is so much, but this is not final, I have still said there will be a drop in speed, which I calculate. I now have the formulation for uh, this formulation I have, I have this Landweber curve. So, depending on my h or hydraulic radius as the case may be, I can calculate V h divided by V i and get the speed loss. Is that clear? 
are you understanding or not tell me okay don't tell me so i get uh, the speed loss here i have said this is delta i have said this as delta c isn't it what did i say delta c and i can get this delta vp and as i have said the frictional resistance will not anymore remain same so you will get the same frictional resistance as here at a lower speed so this point will move here this is my final point of shallow water resistance at this speed this is vh so this will be my speed vh giving me a resistance this corresponding to infin infinity speed v infinity giving me a different resistance rt at that point so if i do this calculation i'll get a shallow water resistance curve which will look something like this this will be rt shallow water okay okay this is how we estimate shallow water resistance now what is the uh, uncertainty in this as you might have noticed that most of these are assumptions uh, that is we have said there are two effects one is the wave making pattern changes and another we have said the speed increases therefore there is a effect of spin drop we haven't really talked about uh, how the speed changes and uh, the boundary layer changes around the ship hull. There will be additional effects which have not been included in this analysis of shallow water resistance. So, actually the drop in speed that is estimated using this method is valid only up to certain amount of restrictions. If the restrictions increase, then the drop in speed may be more. Why is this uh, drop in speed important? Why do we talk about this? If my vessel is not going to move in shallow water, why do I talk about this? We have seen that shallow critical speed in shallow water is dependent on the depth of water. In other words, if I have high speed, then my critical depth or speed to depth relationship will change I may have a higher depth at which that will be the critical speed do you understand if the depth reduces then my critical speed drops but now I am suppose I am moving a passenger ship or a destroyer or some ship which is having a high speed what is the depth at which shallow water effect will start feeling start being felt it will be more than if I move to the same ship at low speed, do you understand what I am saying? I have got a speed which I am moving at 15 knots, a ship moving at 15 knots and I have got say 30 meters of water depth. It may not be important at that water depth, but if I move that same ship at 20, 20 knots, then the water depth effect will be felt. In other words, if I am going for high speed ships, then my shallow water effect becomes more prominent. When you, when I am in service, my ship is going from deep to shallow water, there is a speed drop and it affects fuel consumption of course, because for the same distance you take more time to move. and then you try to find out why it is and you find that the water is shallow that is why this is happening. Perhaps more critical than this is the trial condition in which you have to move a ship where the guarantee terms come into play. When the ship is going out for trial normally the conventional method is move the ship near the shore what is normally known as a measure mile test are you aware of this? 
that is after the ship is built the builder has to satisfy the owner that the speed for which the contract was signed has been achieved so the ship has to be taken out on trial now when you take out the ship on trial normal procedure is is two mile posts are there on the shoreline and the ship goes at a distance from the shore but parallel to the shoreline so that the mile post can be seen and timed this is the simplest explanation i can give now if the ship is going near the shore you may not have enough depth to have the deep water effects completely therefore you may not get your trial speed this is a very critical thing now to do the test therefore if you go far away from the shoreline you are not observing the mile post so maybe you have to take your ship out to somewhere else where you get large water depth near the shoreline where you can conduct the measure mile test in case you can't take the ship out and you have to do this in shallow water then you must be able to find out to calculate and show that since the water depth is low we get a particular speed and if the water was deep we would have got so and so speed that extrapolated speed to deep water should be satisfying the contractual speed the problem there comes that if the water is really low then the extrapolation will not give the speed because of the uncertainties involved which i have just mentioned so sometimes it may be necessary to do model tests in shallow water that's of course a difficult proposition doing model test in shallow water because you have to remove the water to really bring the the general shallow water and the model has to come down in the towing tank which means the measuring equipment etc everything has to come down which may not be possible otherwise the alternatively you may have to have a false bottom on the entire tank which can be lifted to a height to give a shallow water effect in the towing tank many tanks have a deep water tank with a shallow water portion at one end so that shallow water is generated there and you can do the shallow water testing over that uh, length but this means the length of the whole tank increases tremendously as if you are having two tanks anyway talking about guarantee speed we have seen the allowances that we gave to trial conditions we gave correlation allowance over model because of the small hull roughness we gave allowances for wind resistance we gave allowances for appendages and calculated the trial speed now last class i gave you a formulation for roughness did i not i gave what was that uh, it was based on length and a roughness parameter h which i said is the average hull roughness in microns they give that k k divided by l was the parameter on which the allowance depended yeah yeah tell me sir uh, q is equal to 105 into hmm ks by l w l raised to the power 1/3 hmm minus hmm 0.64 hmm into 10 to the power uh, whole whole into 10 to the power this was the roughness allowance we gave and we said that for a new ship ks should be between 125 to 150 microns or 125 to 150 into 10 to the power -6 meters this is what we had said what happens when the ship goes into service 
as the ship goes into service two effects take place one is fouling and the other is roughness why does roughness take place perhaps you are aware roughness take place because of paint deterioration which may leak may expose the steel surface to saline environment causing corrosion corrosion again can be general corrosion general reduction of thickness over a large area or pitting or crevice corrosion where you have pits in the hull surface a deep hole in the hull surface and all these reduce the smoothness of the hull surface so hull becomes rough now corrosion is a very peculiar phenomenon and it cannot be predicted a priori where the ship will corrode whether the ship will corrode in the front back or middle bottom or side general observation is that corrosion occurs mainly where the water level variation is there the so called boot topping region of the ship near the water line but there is large amount of corrosion at the bottom of the ship also now we know that a ship goes into a major survey at the interval of 5 years when the ship is dry docked the fouling is removed and the bottom is at the ship side ship cell is scraped short blasted and painted so what happens to roughness at that stage does it come back to normal normally as the ship goes into service roughness increases but when you bring it to dry dock scrape the paint short blast the surface short blasting is done primarily to smoothen the surface and then paint it again it should become as good as new but it has been found by measurement that generally even after a 5 year survey there is a small increase in roughness the ship never comes back to the new condition in spite of replacement of plates which have reduced to a large extent in thickness in between these 5 years what happens uh, the plate roughens of course and there is large amount of fouling fouling may be removed once in a while but generally fouling will grow fouling is a biophenomenon depending on the environment in which the ship is operating that is uh, whether it's tropical climate or temperate climate and whether it is moving or not moving it is fairly well known if the ship spends a large time in ports particularly tropical ports fouling is very heavy so when it goes out after being in a port the speed drops now the roughness resistance increase due to roughness can be calculated using this formulation if we know what is the roughness ks of the ship at any time but well, it's very difficult to estimate the resistance due to fouling because of the uncertainty in growth of fouling as i have said where the ship is moving at what speed is moving at what how much time it has spent in ports etc is not known so in general if i draw the resistance of a ship as a function of time and this is a zero year and this is the five year period then resistance will increase till the next survey like this and at this stage you remove the fouling and the corrosion i mean smoothen the ship what will happen at this stage as we have noted that the corrosion will slightly increase therefore it will never come back to zero and it will go again 
to something like this in next 5 years and again it will come down to it will go like this it will continue like this. So, a general corrosion increase will be there like this and the resistance curve will be enclosed in this envelope. If I draw the speed curve, it will be just the reverse, it will be high speed at the beginning dropping to a low value, then again increasing and dropping, increasing and dropping. Right? This is very interesting. First of all, this gives us some indication if we can estimate the from the measured speed, if we can estimate the resistance increase, we know at what point of time we require to maintain the hull. May be a scraping of the hull, removal of foulings, even in afloat condition may be desirable. But more important is the trial condition, which I have always said is a very critical for the ship builder and ship owner. You have taken the ship to the dry dock, cleaned the ship, painted the ship again and you are ready to go out to trial. For whatever reason, may be the, it may be as simple as the surveyor not being available or the lifeboat not being available, hence the ship cannot go out to sea or maybe some major production problem. It could also be that there is a storm brewing and you have to wait for 15 days after you have undocked the ship to go to sea trial. This 15 days is critical because what is happening? The ship is standing in water in a port environment for 15 days. So, the fouling that will come up in this case will definitely show you a drop in speed. So, you have to be careful when you go out for trials in what condition your ship is and if you cannot bring back the ship to its original new condition, you must be able to apply suitable corrections to get the proper trial speed. Okay. I think we will stop here. Thank you. morning and uh, this hour we will talk about ship hull form and its relationship to resistance. Um, from the uh, understanding of resistance, it is possible for us to draw some guidelines as to how we can develop a hull form or what are the parameters of hull form that can be controlled to give better resistance characteristics at the design stage. Because once the design is over, the hull form is fixed. If the resistance characteristics are not good, the ship will suffer for its entire life. So, we will see some main parameters of the hull form and how it affects resistance. This will be fairly general analysis of relationship of hull form to resistance. The parameter that affects most the resistance of the ship is the fullness of the ship. How full the ship is represented by the form coefficients. Mainly C B and C P and C midship. We will see all of this. C B of course, the block coefficient tells us how full the ship is. and gives us some idea about how the ends are shaped. So, that uh, generally we can say that uh, 
if the ends are shaped more smoothly or more narrowly, then I can get a higher speed. That means, speed higher speed will lead to lower C B okay, or fine form. That is the reason you will find bulk carriers and tankers are full form ships with high C B and passenger ships, container ships etcetera are finer form. Now, you see when I am talking of speed, I am essentially talking about fruit number, not speed as such. That is, if I have a container ship which is say 250 meters long, one of the large container ships, it can move at 24 knots. Now, what I do is I geometrically can bring the ship down in size. Instead of 250 meters now, let me see I bring it down by half to 125 meters. Every dimension reduces by half. If this, that was moving at 24 knots, will this ship move at 24 knots? Would it mean that it will move at 24 knots? The answer is no. It will move at a speed which will be at the corresponding speed. That means, it will move at 25 divided by root 2. This follows for our curve 2. You see the curve 2 that we showed before, though it has a prominent shoulder, its section area curve here has narrowed, which leads to a finer angle of entrance. Okay. So, it can go like 19.28, you say it can go below that also. Yeah, it can go. That 19.28 is for a pressure point. Okay. So, lower line curve is also an important parameter. Now, then next comes the fore, fore body of the ship, fore body shape. We have three fore body shapes which are extreme and we have to choose one of them or in between them. One is called typically a four body section shape which is like this, this is called V form like a V. Normal ships that have a shape like this will have a section like this, the section comes down like this. The other one is what you call a U form section, more like a U. This case, because it will be difficult for one to close the sections, this will look more like this, the end profile view will look something like this. Sections are more U and lastly you will have the bulbous bow. Okay. And if you draw a section here at the FP itself, you will have this bulb. As we have discussed in both these forms as compared to V form, the volume comes down. Right? If the volume comes down, imagine the sectional area curve, we are provi providing volume, but below the water line. So, the water line becomes smoother, a modern day ship. So, the best way to do is to find out what the statistics say. If you have got large number of ship data, then can we make a statistical analysis and say my ship, since large number of ships of all types fall in a particular pattern the resistance falls in a particular pattern, maybe my ship will fall in that. So, I can estimate my ship resistance and say it will have plus minus 5 percent actual resistance. Now, this has been done rigorously by um, Holtrop. 
NSMB, Netherlands ship, ship, ship model basin, Holtrop and there is another chap called Manen. They have published their statistical data analysis in the 1984-82-84 ISP, International Shipbuilding Progress. What they give you is they have analyzed slow, slow form ships, fast form ships, bulbous bows, non bulbous bows, cruiser sterns, transom stern, stern immersion, various uh, draft conditions with appendages and without appendages. Large amount of data has been collected together and whole set of regression analysis has been done. And knowing your ship parameters of all these quantities, they give a method by which you can estimate the resistance. That is so far the most reliable method of estimating resistance for ships as of today. We do not have, I have mentioned this before, we do not have a fully theoretical method for predicting resistance as yet. So, statistical analysis is the best way to get the resistance of a ship if we do not have the tank test data. Okay. If there are no questions, then we will stop here. Thank you. Thank you.